Good morning, early folks. You are welcome to sing along. Sing along with us. <laughs>
to hear the very beginning of our uh, Him Sing uh, pre-service offerings and uh, what a joy it is to come together to sing our favorite songs. And since we are now a blended service, we um, incorporated your requests as much as possible in both honoring the traditional hymns as well as uh, the more praise or contemporary songs. And so I hope that you enjoy both. Just a reminder, go ahead and fill out your attendance cards now, save them for after the service, and stick them in the basket on your way out, and also prayer requests. If you have any, please go ahead and, and wave those blue cards filled out in the air, and uh, we will receive them and include your requests in our prayers today. Following the hymn sing today, we have light refreshments, so please stay around for a while and visit with one another. Uh, we have noticed that whenever we offer such opportunities, our folks just laugh it up. We love being with each other, and we love having fellowship with one another. So today is a wonderful opportunity to do that. On September 17th, we will be combining the God's Work Our Hands Sunday, which we have been doing the last several years, along with what was previously known, uh, but not a very fitting name, which was Rally Day. So both will be combined. We are calling it Zion's Ministry Madness. There is a meeting for the group that is planning that following this service. On that day, we will be compiling these God's Work Our Hands kits. And so the personal care kits and the baby kits, we've had containers out for the last month or so. And thank you very much for your generous offerings. After last Sunday's worship, we took a tally, and the tally is represented by an announcement in, the result of the tally is represented by an announcement that is in your bulletin. Um, however, we, I, I, we put in there that there are a gold number of kits for each one of those projects, the personal and the baby care kits. And um, if we exceed that number, that is bonus and wonderful. And we have enough of the goods that are not um, actually listed there. Uh, as things that we need with a certain number attached. We have enough to make plenty more kits. So the items that we're really lacking are those that are listed. And I know that some of those came in today. So again, we will make as many kits as possible. And I know already that our goal for the personal care kits was 30. And I know that we've exceeded that by quite a bit. So thank you again for your generosity. Um, just a word about uh, t-shirts that are out. So whenever we have a project like this, including the events that we have for the community, uh, events for, and when I say community, I mean our neighbors around us outside of the church, as well as those events that go into uh, feeding our spiritual lives. Those of us who are members of Thrivent, that means that we have products that we have purchased from Thrivent, which is usually insurance and retirement plans and things like that. Well, we are members of Thrivent, and so some, every now and then you'll hear announcements by that. One of the benefits of being um, a, a Thrivent member is that twice a year, each member can apply for a grant. And the grants are up to $250. And we do that. And whenever we do that, they send us t-shirts. And so we have a table full of t-shirts. Plenty of t-shirts. So please go ahead. We have lots of extra large. Um, they're kind of a nice thin cotton, so I really love to sleep in them because they're not too heavy, but they're very soft and comfy. So please go ahead and check out that table. Help yourself to t-shirts. The newest design are the very dark black. We have some that are a slightly lighter color. Those are left from last year. Every year, Thrivent changes the design slightly lighter color. So just a note to let you know about that. And in next in um, this coming month's newsletter, you'll see an article about our viable program. And I just want to kind of give you a, a hint about why we are doing this, why we are changing our bulbs to LEDs. As home, anyone who's a homeowner probably knows that there is a saving in using LED bulbs. You can uh, understand that in a building like this, where some of our bulbs are odd sizes and large sizes, and we have a lot of bulbs burning all the time, especially with the school in session, uh, we uh, are going through changing this also, <clears throat> excuse me, as being careful of our environment. Craig Sieber came up to me last week. And although we did have a slightly warmer uh, winter this year over last year, he said that our electric bill is down by $6,000 over last year's. Now, if you look at the deficit that we have in our budget, you'll see, add 6000 to that, and you'll see that we would be in a much different place right now if we had not changed all of these bulbs. A lot of that savings is due to the changeover of bulbs. 
we have a few more to go. And that is the reason that week after week we have seen that announcement in your bulletin, a viable. We have just a few more to go and a, a few hundred dollars to kind of catch up with what we've already purchased. And so that is why um, our, your generosity is important in that particular instance. So that's just an explanation and also a praiseworthy exclamation of what God has enabled us to do in changing over these, these bulbs that not only look after care of our creation, but also save some of our resources to put into them the ministries that God is calling us to do in this place. And so it's all a win-win as far as I'm concerned. Are there any other announcements as we begin our worship this morning? I see none, and so I invite you to remain seated as we go ahead and sing our song of preparation, Here I Am to Worship.
us from the power of sin in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. And now our gathering song, Come Thou Almighty King.
Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we continue with the song. The response of reading is Psalm 138. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will go down before the holy temple and praise your name, because of your steadfast love and faithfulness. For you have glorified your name and your word of all things. When I called, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. All the rulers of the earth will praise you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. They will sing of the ways of the Lord. That great is the glory of the Lord. The Lord is high, yet carries to the Lord, perceiving the high from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. You will make good your purpose to me. O Lord, your steadfast love endures forever. Do not abandon me.
question, who do you say that I am? So when people who are not Christian, or people who know perhaps that you are Christian, ask you this question, what do you say? Who is Jesus? That's a real question. Who is Jesus? My Lord and Savior. Good answer. Say again. A son of God. Great answer. The sacrificial lamb. The sacrificial lamb. Excellent. Any other answers? Who do you say that I am? All of those answers are correct. But what do they mean to the people who are asking you that question? What do they mean to our lives? What do they mean to us today? Well, in our gospel today, Jesus poses this question to his disciples when they are in a place called Caesarea Philippi. It is a real place and it exists still today. It was a place historically that was a meeting place, a gathering for people of various cultures and societies, people of different um, belief systems. And in the Jesus time, uh, or before Jesus time, uh, this place was called Panaeus, when the Greek culture took over and they uh, wanted to honor the god Pan. And god Pan was the god, the mythical worship of Pan, who was the god of the wild, of the shepherd, and of uh, flocks. So as you can imagine why in Hellenistic culture, in an area where many people were engaged in shepherding flocks, where raising sheep was very important, not only for the economy, but for the health of the people and the feeding of the people, that would have been important. Prior to the, uh, to the, um, the worship of Pan, there was the worship of Baal that took place in that place. And so when the disciples say in this place, where there are many competing voices, many competing beliefs and value systems, that Jesus is the Son of God, that's something special. It's something spectacular. It's something that perhaps the people of that time couldn't even understand. But in that place, Jesus says that he is establishing the church. Now Matthew, Matthew is the only of the Gospels where Jesus actually uses that church, or whether the Gospel writer uses that word, church. And the word pre-existed Christianity, church simply means an assembly or gathering of people. And God establishes a special assembly, a special gathering of people who will worship him and him only. There is a grotto in this place near Caesarea Philippi. This is a picture of it. It is called the Grotto of Pan. And it is a hewn, uh, an area that is hewn out of rock over how many hundreds, maybe even millions, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years. There is this carving that takes place there. And in Jesus' day, there were aqueducts that had been built by the Romans that still actually exist. And in many places, they are totally intact. And they would deliver water from the springs into this grotto. In this grotto, you can see in the background, there is a rock. Is this the second of the pictures? Is this the second of the pictures? Okay, let's, let's look at the second. You might get a better, a little bit of a better picture of this rock. This rock, it is believed, is what Jesus was referring to. This is a rock that when the water levels rose, because the um, waters were allowed through the aqueducts to enter this grotto, Everything about that rock would have been submerged, except for its buried rock. It would be as if this rock here was totally submerged by water, except for the very top of it. And in the time of the Hellenistic uh, culture, when the Hellenistic culture was very popular in that place, and that god Pan was one, among many, but one of the main gods that was worshipped there, there was probably a, a statue of Pan on top of that rock. And Jesus gestures to this rock and says that he is establishing the church. That nothing, not even the gates of Hades, shall prevail over it. 
You can see in this picture a little bit of that caving or, or that carving of, out of the rock. But if you were to, if we were to go back to that last picture, you would see that this is actually a very, very large rocky structure that is over this singular rock. Uh, you can't really tell in that picture, but there are other uh, pictures, and um, you can certainly look them up, and I can probably find them for you as well. The sea city, see, the, the city of Caesarea Philippi still does exist, and in Jesus' day, it was a de uh, a, an area that was fed by so many different cultures, and all of these gods of the past were still, for by many people, being worshipped, being adored. And here comes this church of Jesus Christ that is being established by Jesus. And Peter is told that he is going to be important to the beginnings and to the functioning and to the survival of this church, at least in its early days. So Peter and the disciples like him had to be pretty certain about who it was that they said Jesus was. And certainly your answers were perfect. For certainly Jesus is the Son of the living God. He is our Savior. Jesus is the one who is not only the Son of God, but very many people refer to him as our friend or our brother. But we need to know and we need to convey that the personhood of Jesus and what Jesus is, which is or who Jesus is, which is the one who embraces and embodies the perfect character of God. That perfect character of God that is characterized by love and by justice and humility. That this is the God that Jesus embodies and it is his teachings that this church that Jesus himself is embodied, it is uh, establishing, also embodies and characterizes and practices and carries out. Earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, in fact, throughout the Gospel of Matthew, time and time again, Matthew warns the people, Jesus in his own words warns the people that they must not be stumbling blocks. They must not erect barriers to the people who are outcasts the people who have little or no voice, to the people who are not considered part of the crowd, in this case, part of the faithful, those who don't yet know Jesus, those who don't yet ascribe to Jesus being the Savior, that they must not pre present barriers or stumbling blocks to these people. We know in our day and age and throughout history, However, sometimes the church itself has been a stumbling block where certain practices carried out within the church and by the church has been the stumbling block. Now, if we go back to the strata, if we were able to get a really close uh, image of the rock in, in that grotto, we would see that it is engraved with crosses. A sure sign that in the era of the early Christian church, this was also likely a place of Christian worship and, of course, certainly Christian pilgrimage. People still go there to view this grotto, especially as many scholars ascribe this place as the place where the story that we read today took place. And when Peter makes his confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, he, in fact, makes an astounding statement of faith for all of the reasons that I just told you. For all of the reasons, because of all of those competing voices, the least popular of which, perhaps, was his own, stating that Jesus, this person who rose from what we might characterize as poverty, this one who was born into a world and then immediately had to take exile in Egypt, that this person who was not of of rank or privilege or wealth was the Son of God, the one that we would worship, the one that we would say is the illustration, the embodiment of God's love to us. Jesus Christ is He. It's hard to 
imagine being in this grotto without actually being there. It's hard to imagine that rock almost completely submerged by water, but knowing that the top never is. And in Jesus' pronouncement to the disciples, he says that that rock, that that church, that that part that is standing above the turmoil, above the turbulent waters, above the floods, will continue to exist, will persevere, will never be overtaken. Jesus is saying that no matter what oppression or persecution, what, no matter what other voices are saying, the church of Jesus Christ is established by Jesus himself and will never be overtaken. My friends, there are many in current times, and some of you have made this lament as well, but what is happening to the church? What is happening in our world? What is happening in a world that seems to have growing agnosticism and atheism and a growing denial of who God is, that there is even a God, and certainly who Jesus Christ is? I hear the question over and over again, what is happening to the church? How can the church survive? This is certainly not the church today that I knew as a child that my grandparents worshipped at, my parents worshipped at, my forebears worshipped at. Perhaps some of you even have pastors in the background, and you in, in your backgrounds, and you know that they worshipped and they led very different churches. And so the question today is, everything has changed so much. What happens when it totally changes? What will happen when the present generation of faithful ones, of believers, passes away? And there is a real fear that underlies these questions, underlies these laments. There's a grief in the passage of time that seems to have stolen away the security that the church of former times offered. And so the question is raised, what will happen to this church? What will happen when not only the music choices and the music style changes, but the service itself changes? The words that we are so connected to are no longer the ones being used week after week after week as if by rote. What will happen to this church? And if the church is vulnerable, what does that mean for us? To which Jesus answers, even the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And I don't know about you, but I am comforted by those words. I am assured by those words. I truly believe that the church will be changed. It may look totally different in my grandson's generation than it does now, but the church will exist. And those who are faithful to Jesus Christ will continue to proclaim his grace his grace in the face of sin and failure and everything that comes with it. Let's be real. There is nothing that is made by human hands that will survive the test of time. Eventually, all that we have made will pass away. Now, you all know that this is not real rock, right? You know that this has been created for some uses here at Zion. And everything that we have made will go away, will be broken down, but the church of Christ never will. For when it stands like that stone, no matter the waters that swirl around it, no matter the turmoil, Jesus Christ, who is faithful, will continue to lead it and to guide it and to call faithful to do his work in the world. The church of the future will be equally faithful, equally beloved, and equally fed by the Holy Spirit and God's word and promise. The church of Jesus Christ, you see, is not limited to a time or a place or a particular community or a building. All of those are temporal. The early churches that existed mostly in houses years and years ago in those, in those decades after Jesus are long gone. They have vanished. 
although there are still a few physical remnants still present at archaeological sites. But the church? Here we are, after over 2,000 years of persecution and turmoil from within and from without. Today, in just a few moments, we will sing the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. And I want to hear you singing those words out, my friends, because that is the truth. That is what gathers us together. That is what Jesus is telling us today. When we are faithful in justice, faithful in love, faithful in worship of God, the church remains and has created communion by Jesus to do God's work and to share the marvelous story of God's grace. The church of Jesus Christ has survived the destruction of Rome, the burning of temples, the waging of wars, wars, the falling of bombs, the passage of time. The church is not going anywhere because Jesus Christ is present. And Jesus has promised he will be wherever two or three are gathered. And so let us share with others the story of Jesus Christ. The story that even goes beyond those proclamations that he is the Son of God, that he is our Savior. Let us tell others about how he has changed our lives and is working through us in love and in grace and in mercy. How he has been always and is now loving and embracing this world in spite of and even because of its sin. Saving it, yes, but transforming it to be a reflection of his grace. A church that is predicated on the kingdom of God and is marked, as I said over and over just now, by forgiveness, by mercy, by justice. When Jesus tells Peter that what he binds on earth will be bound in heaven, Jesus is perhaps reminding us what he has been telling us all along. That the disciples of Jesus are not to be stumbling blocks. For when they are, they are stumbling blocks to the kingdom of God, to people experiencing that same transformation, that same love, that same justice that Jesus stood for and that Jesus embraces. As disciples, if we bind a person on earth to the extent that we turn them away from the gates of the kingdom, they are bound forever. Instead, the way of Jesus is to open doors, open hearts, heal, and feed abundantly. Through our worship today and through our song, let us be reminded of all that God is calling us to and all of who God is for us, for the church, for the world. Amen. Please stand as we sing our hymn of the day. <laughs> Thank you. 
declare the universal faith of all Christians that Christ is God incarnate and that through him God is saving all humanity. In the death and resurrection of Jesus, God proclaims forgiveness and life, and where there is death, even the death of sin. Carol, 
Evelyn, Chris, Suzanne, Jeff, the friends and family of Mark Miller and Betty Eden, our service personnel, our homebound members, those on our ongoing prayer list, first responders and local police. Are there others for whom we should pray? We offer thanks, prayers of thanksgiving for Jackie's family, Healy for Alan, Mary, Joanna's successful surgery for Bella, good results for George, successful surgery for Weston. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Encourage those who offer their gifts and talents in service to your church. Energize this congregation is rostered in lay leaders, musicians, teachers, readers, and administrators, so they may be transformed in sharing your grace. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of all the saints, death is overcome in Christ's resurrection. We rejoice with the faithful departed. Sustain us in hope until we come at last to our heavenly home. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let us share the sign of Christ's peace with one another.
transform us to be the body of Christ, that feasting on you, our lives may reflect your generosity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand. Mm -hmm.
them inside, invite you to go ahead and take them now. As you break the package open and consume the bread inside, remember that this is the body of Christ given for you. And when you are ready to drink the grape juice, remember that this is the blood of Christ shed for you. All others may come forward at the guidance and the direction of the ushers, beginning with the choir.
verses 1 and 2 of the beautiful Savior.
Prince of Mercy, and feed us at your table. Amid the cares of this life, strengthen us to love you with all our hearts, serve our neighbors with a willing spirit, and honor the earth you have made through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, people of God, receive this blessing. May God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit keep your going out and your coming in both now and forevermore. Amen. All right, after this wonderful hymn sing, we're going to fly out of here. <laughs> we're sure we're driving the bus. <laughs> no crashes, no crashes. It's a flying bus. With some fancy ivory tickling by Greg. <laughs> 